Okay. Welcome today to In Conversation with George Courtauld. My name is Claire Willits. I'm the Exhibitions and Collections Curator at Braintree Museum. And this is part of a series of short in conversation and Q&A sessions with people about um, the Courtauld women and particularly family Courtauld um, female members. Um, and um, today we wanted to talk a little bit about how the Courtauld family and the company was largely run by male members of the family, but actually there was some hugely um, significant role that female workers for the company played, played but also um, family members that were very influential and interesting in their own right. Um, and so we just want to sort of start talking about that and having a conversation about that. So, George, I wanted to ask you, first of all, before the family had a textile business, they were very successful silversmiths. And in particular, Louisa Harina was a very um, important woman in that business. Can you tell us a bit about her? Yes, well, um, the Huguenots um, were quite well known silversmiths, and we were one of the uh, families um, who got involved in silver from about 1690 to about 1790, about 100 years. Um, we did quite a lot of silver, which I saw in the, uh, in the Hermitage in... Um, in in, in uh, St. Petersburg, and um, one of the quarters, the last male quarter to be a silversmith, died fairly young, and his widow, Louisa Perina, took over. Uh, she became quite famous amongst silversmiths as she produced very high quality stuff. Probably in, at the same date, there was another female silversmith called Hester Bateman, she was probably better known than Perina, but uh, Perina was ne nevertheless a top quality silversmith. Caroline came through Essex, um, having had a frightful row with the king. The Cortos were a leading family. This was about 1820 who took her up and looked after her and, uh, and, and consoled her. And, and my, my ancestors were very strong um, uh, believers in the equality of women. And particularly my six, one, two, three, four, five, six great aunts who were leading suffragettes. My, my aunts, I'll just read out their names. Catherine Minner, Elizabeth, who became a doctor, Ruth, Louise, who, who was the only pretty one and who drowned. Dorothy and Cicely, who was the only one who married. And she married her cousin, William Courtauld, and became Lady, Lady Courtauld. Of, of those people I read out, the, all of them were, were busy in the background, if, if nothing else. But um, Aunt Min, Catherine Minna and Elizabeth were in the front of the, of the action. Um, Dorothy, Cicely and Ruth, stayed more quietly in the background but because they were very rich they, they did hand in over a lot of money to keep things going. Um, now would you like me to talk about uh, Catherine Minna particularly? I would love you to talk about, I would love to talk about Catherine yeah because she's a fascinating character. Well um, I've got to sadly say that uh, she died three years before I was born so anything I tell you about her, I heard either from my father, um, who was very fond of her and who was her heir. She left him the 2000 um, acre Knight's estate and the farm where we still live. So I owe her a lot. Um, she was quite, from an early stage, she was extremely um, bolshy. I think I put, can put it that way. And her father, George Courtauld, wrote to her on February the 1st, 1897. You seem to have waged a war against a parent from your youth up when poor Frau Buab complained to me about tearing up your corsets. And when you set your face against dancing and all the gentle and more graceful exercises and went in for muscle and strength. Well, she wanted to be a man really. And she wore man's clothes from waist up, even though she always wore, wore a skirt. She lived with a female companion, somebody we called Aunt Mary, Mary Gladstone. She was a brilliant shot, a brilliant horsewoman, and, um, and a very firm um, counsellor 
and employer. Um, if you like, I'll read out various of the things she was involved with. Absolutely. A bit of a list. Okay. Um, she was president of the Essex Agricultural Show for some time. She was a parish councillor in Coningane, and she ruled the parish uh, parishioners with a rod of iron. She was secretary of the North West Essex branch of the National Union of Women's Suffragette Societies. Uh, she was an Essex County councillor uh, for um, 20 years. Uh, she founded the building of the village hall in Coning Gain. Uh, she was a me member of the East Essex Hunt and she was a, a founder of the Women's Agricultural and Horticultural International Union, which later was called the Women's Farm and Garden Association. And she was uh, one of the founders of the Women's National Land Service Corps, which later became the Women's Land Army. Um, so that's quite a few things. And I've got her diary, which she, which she wrote, and she was busy the whole time. And she wrote a, a marvelous journal um, in, in imitation of Rudyard Kipling's um, Agricultural Year, which I think I may have sent on to you, mm -hmm. which shows what she was doing um, for a, a year's farming in nights in the year 1900. As a person, like all my aunts, she was rather small, court old after all means shorty, um, handsome rather than pretty, um, and um, clever and uh, sharp. And she died in a chair, which is um, in the room next door to me here. And she, I don't think she was particularly loved by the people who, who knew her, but she was admired. Um, I think she wasn't particularly loved because, she, apart from her lady companion, she was a pretty abrupt, she didn't suffer fools gladly, and there's a lot of fools around, and they rather resented, <laughs> resented that. So that's basically Aunt Min. She's very much an Essex woman. She was a, uh, a farmer and farmed eventually 2,000 acres. Um, and um, she was a leading light in the, in the, in the suffragettes. And in, in the census, which she had to, um, I haven't got it here. She wrote in the census when she signed in her name, I was something in red ink. I resent having to uh, uh, get, get involved in the census when there's a woman, I am not allowed, even though a ratepayer, to have a, a vote, which of course is quite logical. And it's amazing. And her sister, Elizabeth, who became a doctor, had the same problem. Shall I mention her, Elizabeth? Absolutely, please, yes. Yeah. So Eli Elizabeth is her half-sister. No, her, uh, yes, half-sister. Half-sister, My grand right, grandfather yeah. had three wives. Um, the first one, um, a miss, oh, a miss to start with, Br a Brumley, had Aunt Min and her brother George. Next one was, um, had uh, Elizabeth, Louise, Ruth and Dorothy and Cicely. And um, the last wife, um, um, who had been a Miss Sparrow, had just one child, my Uncle Herbert, who was known as Hellfire Dick, and died in Doe's Corner with a, with a wagon on top of him because he'd taken the corner too fast when he was completely drunk. Anyhow, I divert. Um, <clears throat> I remember Aunt Liz, Elizabeth, the doctor, um, because she died in 1948, I think, 47 when I was about nine. And like all my aunts, she was very small and very alert and very bustling. She wanted to be a doctor from an early age. And it was basically pretty well impossible to be one in England. The English disapproved of female doctors. So she got, um, she went to, I think, uh, Belgium to start with and got her doctorate and then uh, worked in the um, Royal Hospital in Scotland. The Scotch had a different different ideas about female doctors and the English. When World War One was, she then also worked in India for a bit, charity work we we call nowadays. I think she was uh, to Germany when the war her. started. She could have yes, and and Serbia, but that was later. Uh, when the war started, the whole of the uh, Royal Scottish Hospital was transported to um, a monastery called um, Rochefort, I think it was. And Aunt Ruth was there 
behind the front lines pretty well throughout the whole war. And she wrote a, a fascinating collecting, collection of letters to her sister Ruth, which uh, the, uh, the, um, I think most of them are in the uh, um, University of Aberdeen. But I've seen copies and a, a, a typical example of the sort of work she had to do is a letter, letter which, in which she said, a very difficult night, um, we had to take six legs, legs off at the thigh by candlelight. And when the Germans sent their gas bombs overhead, we had to blow out the candles. Um, she got um, the White Eagle of Serbia, which is a, a bravery medal, the Légion d'honneur and the... Um, what was the other one? Um, Quatre Guerre. Quatre Guerre. Uh, the women were never sat around doing nothing. For example, even my mother during the war drove um, an ambulance for the American hospital in Braintree. In, and a, a tea and buns wagon around the uh, searchlight batteries and anti-aircraft batteries locally. So she, and we had a, a terrific party, it's pretty well it seemed to me every night with the American uh, officers um, from the aerodrome in Ells Cone and the more mobile uh, invalids from the hospital and of course the, um, the, the British troops from the aircraft batteries. So we always when I was a child, seemed to be having parties here. And at the top of that, of course, my father being an SOE, a sabotage, we used to have um, saboteurs, French, Jews, Lats, Poles, would come here as a rest house, ready to anything from a weekend to three weeks. Um, so this house, Knight's Farm, was very busy in the war. It's